Palestinian officials are accusing Israel of killing over 500 people in an airstrike on a hospital in Gaza City where thousands of civilians had sought refuge. Israel's denying responsibility, claiming the explosion was caused by a failed rocket fired by the militant group Islamic Jihad. Palestinian officials have blasted Israel's claim, pointing out Israel, uh, the military, had already hit the hospital just days before. As we continue to look at Israel's war on Gaza, we're joined by Rashid Khalidi, the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies at Columbia University, a renowned Palestinian-American scholar. He's the author of a number of books, including his latest, The Hundred Years' War on Palestine. Professor Khalidi's new piece for The New York Times is headlined, The U.S. Should Think Twice About Israel's Plans for Gaza. We're going to go to that in just a minute, Rashid, what the U.S. should be thinking about right now. But if you can begin by responding to these developments of the last 24 hours with the explosion um, at Al-Ahli Hospital and the significance of this. Well, it's obviously had an enormous significance. It led to the cancellation of a summit uh, that uh, was planned for Amman with President Biden. Um, the Arab participants all pulled out uh, after this atrocity. Um, I think it's also led to increased uh, anger all over the Arab world. Uh, there are demonstrations in at least eight or nine Arab capitals um, as a result of this. There were already there was already rage at American blanket American support for Israel. And I think this has increased that. Um, I think that it, it is uh, very hard to believe, given that Israel has threatened hospitals and schools in the past, and it's hit hospitals and schools in the past, and that the kinds of uh, weapons used by Islamic Jihad and Hamas have very limited warheads, that this could have, nested, could have been, uh, as the Israelis claim, uh, a, a misfire. Um, as, you, as you reported, a uh, piece of video that they put up turns out to, to have been uh, uh, dated from a period after the attack on this hospital. In any case, whoever whoever was responsible, um, the uh, the result will be enormous, enormous anger at the United States for its support of Israel, as well as a, a further increase in this enormous death toll inside Gaza. Um, Dr. Mustafa Barghouti, the Palestinian legislator and medical doctor himself, said they actually had, in a very short period of time, a number of um, uh, uh, explanations of what happened. At first, they didn't say this. They said that Hamas was operating underneath the hospital. Um, then they said they were using Palestinians as human shields, sort of, to explain what had happened. Then they came up with this. Now, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, we had on Sharif Abdel Qaddus, who this is award-winning documentary, The Killing of Shireen Abu Akhla, um, won the George Polk Award for that, documenting what Israel said about the murder of this Palestinian American journalist. Um, she had. Uh, they first said she was killed by a Palestinian gunman. Uh, right. Then said evidence was inconclusive. Then, after enormous pressure and multiple investigations by many news outlets and human rights groups, they said they likely killed her, but not intentional and caught in crossfire. Something that was disproven by human rights group after forensic architecture study of the whole thing. Uh, showing right. it was an Israeli sniper, Professor Khalidi. I mean, Israel has an enormously successful public relations machine. It took them, I think, 45 minutes to put out the specific cover story on this one, and it was immediately knocked down, as I think you've already reported, when it turned out that the piece of film that they produced uh, actually uh, dated 40 minutes after the attack on the hospital. The New York Times pointed that out, the timestamp. And then they, they actually retracted um, um, their, their, the video from, uh, from X, from Twitter. Precisely. Precisely. I mean, they, they have a, a well-oiled uh, machine to manufacture uh, cover stories for everything they do. Uh, they have been warning hospitals that they are targets since before, just after this, uh, this attack, the initial attack. Uh, uh, out of Gaza on, on the 7th of October. Uh, they hit this hospital the other day, as you just reported. Uh, they hit a school today. Um, uh, if you read the uh, uh, Israeli press, you have senior Israeli generals and retired generals talking about places like hospitals and schools as targets, because they claim there are Hamas bunkers beneath them. 
Um, so it's hard, it's hard not to accept that this was an Israeli airstrike or an Israeli bombardment. In any, in any case, uh, I think per, here perception is reality. Given that Israel has dropped 6,000 bombs, at least on the Gaza Strip in the last 11 days, it's very hard to believe uh, that it will be very hard, at least for people in the Middle East, who know how Israel systematically lies about what it does in military operations to believe that this was anybody else than Israel. And I think that's the important fact to retain. People in Palestine, people in the Arab world, people in everywhere except in the American, Western European media, media bubble uh, are going to uh, chalk this up to Israel's attack on Gaza. So talk about um, your piece. The U.S. should think twice about Israel's plans for Gaza. Explain what you see unfolding now and respond to President Biden sitting down with the prime minister Netanyahu today and saying the other team did it, attacking the hospital, and go on from there. Well, I mean, the president has bonded the United States to Israel at the hip uh, since very soon after this uh, horrible escalation started. And uh, in so doing, he's made the United States responsible in the eyes of the world for everything. And this is the latest example of that. He's basically read from an Israeli teleprompter, as he seems to do routinely. Uh, uh, on, when anything relating to the Middle East uh, comes up. It's almost as if his lines are scripted in Tel Aviv uh, at the Israeli Defense Ministry, um, where their disinformation headquarters <laughs> are located. Um, and he uh, has, I think, put the United States in a, in a position that I, I am not entirely sure anybody in his administration realizes. Um, the United States is going to be vilified, not just in the Middle East, as a result of it's unlimited support for Israel. Um, the, the, what we are seeing now is only the beginning. Uh, the munitions that are being sent, the aircraft carriers that have been sent to the eastern Mediterranean, the, the huge uh, bill that they're going to put before Congress uh, for, I've seen a figure of $100 billion, um, is going to cement in people's minds the idea that the United States and Israel are one, which means that whatever happens in Gaza going forward in terms of people being killed, innocent civilians being killed, in terms of uh, population being expelled. The, basically, we're talking about ethnic cleansing of northern, northern Gaza, and heaven forbid people actually being forced out of Gaza into Egypt, which is still a possibility, even though the Egyptians have resisted. All of these things will be put down, not just to Israel, but to the United States. And I don't think they fully realize, or if they do, they haven't done anything about it, that this is, is, is what the president has this is where the president has put the United States, um, for whatever reason, uh, electoral reasons, his own personal sympathy for Israel. It really doesn't matter. Um, we are now in a situation where the United States, in my view, has put itself in a more precarious position in the Middle East than it has any time since the 1967 war. Talk about what's happening on the northern border, on the Israel-Lebanon border, and Hezbollah, and the um, uh, back and forth uh, rocket fire that's going on there and what this could signify? Well, I mean, the most apocalyptic scenario, which I hope and pray does not come about, will, would be a, a full-scale war um, on, on, on the northern border uh, uh, between Hezbollah and Israel. Uh, that has the potential to draw many other actors in and, 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 and turn into an even wider war than that, possibly, heaven forbid, uh, involving uh, Syria and, and, uh, and Iran and, and then, indeed, perhaps the United States. Um, that, would be, that would be a real apocalyptic scenario. Um, I have a sense that the United States, Iran and Hezbollah and Israel uh, are all reluctant to go too far down that path. Uh, any one of them might do something that could provoke that kind of escalation. But the real problem is unintended consequences of actions that are out of control. Um, whatever Israel or Hezbollah or Iran and the United States may want, uh, there may be actions that will precipitate a, 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 a rapid escalation. Um, and that would really, I mean, the situation is appalling as it is. It really would be infinitely worse. The devastation of Lebanon that would follow, 
the the, the involvement of north, of north communities in northern Israel would be devastated as well. Um, but the possibility of that growing even wider um, is is to me terrifying. Talk about who Biden hears. I mean, on the one hand, you have uh, Jordan canceling the summit. He was going to meet with the king, with the Egyptian president Sisi, um, and with Mahmoud Abbas, head of the Palestinian Authority, who turned around as soon as the bombing happened and said he wouldn't participate. Then Jordan canceled. Now the U.S. is saying they canceled it mutually. Um, but what exactly this means? So the only image is President Biden hugging uh, Israeli President Herzog and the prime minister Netanyahu at the airport when he arrived. But even at home, uh, State Department officials afraid to raise the issue of Palestinian deaths. HuffPo had a very interesting piece on thin ice. Some Biden administration staffers feel stifled discussing the horrors in Gaza. And they talk about a call um, made by um, made by uh, the <clears throat> head. Let me see if I can find this. A call with Muslim staffers um, that uh, where they were told to talk about their concerns. And they talked about being afraid of being fired, of being blacklisted if they dared raise the actual concern they have um, about what's happening and what the death toll could be and the position that uh, President Biden is taking right now. We are moving into a McCarthyite era where expression of sympathy for Palestinians is equated with terrorism and may be met with police state tactics. Students are being visited by the FBI. I'm not in the least surprised that a government is sending the FBI to talk to student activists is clamping down on its own employees who dare to express humanitarian s sentiments. Um, you are required now to utter a mantra in which you exclusively talk about Israeli suffering. Uh, and if you do not do that, you are branded and doxxed and so on and so forth. Um, that that's happening in the academic, in, in academia and universities. It's happening in companies. And it's, I am sure, happening within the federal government. I have no information about that. Um, but th that is in line with the uh, administration's position, which is that this is a one-sided uh, affair in which on the one side is absolute evil, something which, according to administration spokesman, is worse than ISIS, Daesh. Um, and with that kind of Manichaean uh, point of view, uh, clearly anyone who expresses any dissent, you know, you're, you're, you are supporting absolute evil if you talk about anything but the unlimited suffering of Israelis. Now, the suffering of Israelis is unquestionable, but that that should be the only obsession of the president and his men and women. Um, puts the United States in a position where maybe in, an, in, a, in a sound bubble of the United States, the, the so-called Western world, um, it, it's comfortable. But with the rest of the world, that will not wash, uh, including countries that are not particularly supportive of Palestine, countries like India, China, and so forth. Those are countries that, and, and other parts of the world, I think, see things the very, very same way. Um, so I don't know that these people understand the degree to which they're harming our, this country. Uh, by this kind of blind, one-sided, Israel-first uh, uh, approach. Let me ask you, Rashid Khalidi, if you were president, if you were President Biden, uh, what would you do right now? What would I do right now? I would immediately call for a ceasefire. I would make sure that the hostages were released immediately. Uh, it is unconscionable that they be held. Uh, that would require a negotiation between Israel and Hamas about what the terms for those that release would be. I would insist on that. It is absolutely urgent those people be gotten out. Those, most of those are innocent civilians, certainly the civilians amongst them, uh, or many of them are innocent civilians. The second thing I would do was would be to say to Israel, look, there is this Palestine question. It's been the problem for 75 years. If you don't address it, the United States will not be uh, willing to offer unlimited support. And addressing it means talking about Palestinian self-determination talking about ending the occupation, talking about rolling back settlements, not limiting the unlimited expansion of settlements. I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole set of things which, without which you will never have a resolution of this. And so I would work towards a, 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 a lasting resolution of a struggle that's been going on, as I say in the book, for more than 100 years, um, instead of yet another Band-Aid, yet another 
uh, attempt to uh, stabilize a status quo which is massively unfavorable to the Palestinians and which will only lead to more suffering for everybody concerned. That is an idealistic position, perhaps. But I don't think that anybody who has any sense of how this is likely to develop would say anything different, frankly.